on the 215, we meet an artist whose crafts are legal tender. Check out 10 years of creative collaborations with Amber Arts, get in the spirit with New Hope's ghostly tours, and of course, close out with a 215 flashback fave. Welcome to the 215, I'm Mike, she's Breland, and we are on the campus of Temple University. In this building called the Tyler School of Art and Architecture to be exact. And you took classes here. I did. As a student, I took classes in the basement. That's where art history is, or at least was at the time. Were other students, um, did they have to go to the basement, or was it just you? No, it, there, was a, there was a class. Oh, there's people. classroom. Don't worry, it wasn't a punishment or anything. Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> because yeah, art history is my minor. There you go. That's her minor. How about this room? This room is an exhibit in itself and there is one artist did all of this and we're going to talk a little bit more about him and his artwork in just a little bit first things first another. let's meet stacy who's another artist St does she have it going on i mean i don't know you know that that old song well as, <laughs> as the kids say her art is money with art, it's just kind of one of those things that's always been like within me. Like even when I was really young, just always drawing or like had really cool art teachers. I'm an artist that works with coins and changes the value of money by physically using my techniques to like insert into the material to like upgrade the value. I just got to be interested in like money itself, like the physical aspect of it, what was on the money, Abraham Lincoln, or if you cut into it, that it was metal. I've been embroidering and stitching equal time to metalworking, like making things out of coins and pennies and making jewelry and sculpture and metal. I started stitching dollars, like just one little X and a dollar to represent like a second or time. And it was very similar to the penny work I was doing, like just cutting a penny and that would make it hopefully maybe more valuable if I did something, I don't know, better with it than just a penny. I keep coming back to it kind of partly because it's like a relentless just ambition to keep changing like something like a penny like how many things could you do with that and it turns out like you can do a lot of things with it and it just keeps going like an idea will lead to the next idea will lead to the next idea but i love how people can come to the work and see it for maybe you see an embroidery it has a funny costume on it and then you're like oh that's abraham lincoln oh that's a dollar or same with the pennies, it's like, oh, that looks like a hatchet, like, why is it copper? And then you see it's all like fabricated from pennies. So it gives the viewer this kind of like baseline of like something they're familiar with, which I love that is about value. And a lot of the work is about value, like questioning how much your time is worth is the tool series. Um, and yeah, I think that play with the viewer has always been important to me. My work is rooted in coins and manipulating money, and which is not illegal despite popular belief. I get that a lot of shows is like, isn't this illegal? And it's, no, it's not illegal. You have to have fraudulent intent, like counterfeiting for it to be illegal to deface money. I think it's important to just know what art is, that you don't just come to something and you're like, what is that? And it's like, oh, it's art. Like, it, it's just something expressive of an emotion or a feeling or a statement that a person has. So I don't think everyone has to, like, make art or do art, but it, I think it's important as a culture just that we have art. So for more on Stacey and her monetary masterpieces, yes. you can go to her Instagram, which is at Stacey Lee Weber. I was going to buy one of her pieces, but she nickel and dime me. Oh, boy. Here we go. Already we're starting off with the dad jokes. Stop <laughs> it. Stop it. Okay, now we're going to go to an art collective. Yeah, this is Amber Art and Design. You're only as strong as the community that surrounds you, and so this is a, a, a great visual representation of the vibrancy and the health and the talent that kind of surrounds us at all times, whether we know it or not. There's a lot that comes across between people in art making that might be harder to, to get there as quickly in just, in just a conversation. Amber Art and Design, we're a collective. We're five artists. We joined together uh, about 10 years ago. 
and we really wanted to create a space where we could be autonomous as artists. We wanted to share resources, we wanted to collaborate, and we wanted to be able to support each other so we could do projects that were bigger than what any each individual one of us could do by ourselves. In my work, I love to, to look at and think about the layers of time and the memories that live in our bodies and that are kind of between all of us. This exhibition represents 10 year of communal and collective thought, uh, public art creation. I can feel a lot of overwhelm from a lot of the artists that we've worked with for the last several years with everything that people have gone through. Um, so I was also kind of trying to pull out some of that overwhelm and um, kind of chaos that I can feel in the people around us and kind of throw it, throw it somewhere to then transform it. All this should be in the living rooms and lounges of, pe of all these new condos that Everybody. they're building uh, yeah. around town. Every single one of these pieces should be alive in somebody's house. We've done a ton of murals. We've worked with hundreds of artists all over the country and in other countries as well. Looking at public spaces and using a collective model for getting the community involved, using art as a way to get people involved in the process of designing public spaces. And really just use art as a way, art as a tool for expression so people can add their voice to the process. If we're putting art out into the world, we want it to reflect the community where the artwork is staying. We want that artwork to speak to people. We want it to tell their story. When they see us out there painting, they want to pick up a paintbrush and they want to come and paint with us. There is something magical about art making and creation and I think everybody has it. People are excited to see something positive, to see that there's an opportunity for them and their kids to be involved in creating this artwork that's going to live for the next couple decades. In making art, there's a lot of trust and and calm that can kind of happen. It can be really therapeutic. It can be, our processes can be really celebratory and bring a lot of levity to some really difficult situations. Every project that we do, we're meeting people, we're building these relationships, and then over the years, we're strengthening those relationships, and that has been what has allowed us to be able to do our best work. I just think of it as like this continuous web that's building of community and, and connection. There's so many instances I've had where I've been in the presence of a performance or um, a, you know, a public musical performance um, where there's just that, that indescribable um, connection that you can have to the people that are experiencing it with you. Art definitely has the power of getting at the things that are hard to say. It, it ignites our emotions. Collaborator and curator Jose Ortiz. He's the one, the mad scientist that, that laid out the space. It's meant to be almost like you're one, walking through a metaphorical and metaphysical body, and then two, also walking through a mural. So when you think of the body, this table structure would be the spine, and that is where we internalize everything, and that's where we're, we want this to be kind of like the beating heart of the whole space. And if we do programs or have food, we want this to be the center point of it all. Uh, almost like the rib cage and organs, you have these walls, and the walls represent us as initial internalized collaborators. So the ones that, 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 that keep the house together, the glue that keeps everything uh, functioning. This wall represents the, the local talent that, that, that is kind of hidden here in Philadelphia, and we're pushing for it to, to have the platforms that they deserve. There's something about people that just chase their dream, man, and figure out a way to earn a living doing it just blows my mind. These are people that, that, that continue to push that border knowing that, you know, nothing's a guarantee and that their own inner creation, something that was brought up from within, is fueling what drives their livelihood. And you know, that's a special place in life. I think that's what separates us as, as humans from the things that we call animals. How many people can really say that they followed their dream? Well, their current show runs all the way till November 9th. Plenty of time to catch yep. it. And for more information, you can just head to the website right here at the bottom of your screen. And I think that shows at Crane Arts, too, which is a great yes, space. Yes, it really is. Uh, I believe it's time. <laughs>
to reveal the artist. So this is all done by Isaac Tunwalen. He is a Philly-based artist, yep. and he created all of these works specifically for this space here at Tyler. It runs till December, so you can come and check it out because this is really, really unique, really different, very cool. What would you say that is? Um, a caterpillar. That's what I'm Kinda seeing, Kind of like too. the Hungry Caterpiller, remember? Oh, yeah. As a kid? Yeah. That's uh, what it reminds me of. He's into that. He's also into cats. Mm -hmm. Well, come and... Me, too. This entire <laughs> room is one piece of art. Yeah, it's really it's awesome. Crazy. So definitely come see it. Like I said, open till January, yep. so it'll be here for you. Mm -hmm. um, Boo! Are we ready to get a little spooky? Yeah. We're going to take a ghost tour where things go bump in the night. <laughs> And in this segment, we're going to go beyond the 215 and go out of our way, for some reason, to scare ourselves. Beyond the grave, beyond the 215. This is... New Hope. And a ghost tour. They were brave enough to stop the car, roll down the window, and ask him, do you need a ride? And then he slowly vanishes in front of their eyes. Ghost Tours of New Hope, we share with you the mystery and the history of New Hope. It is a walking tour. It takes about an hour. We walk around to the different locations where true documented stories have taken place. Quite a few guests will take pictures and something will come back paranormal. And it could be anything from catching an, uh, an apparition to catching orbs. Orbs is, is typical what people will catch. We encourage people to come with their cameras and if you have a paranormal device that you want to use we certainly do encourage that and we have through the years and through the years that i've been doing we've had paranormal investigators show up on the tour and they wave around whatever they're using and doing and um and sometimes something very interesting will happen and sometimes it doesn't you know one of the things that i've always said uh is that you can't direct a ghost when to show up and the window on the right the, the third floor and they said, oh my gosh, it's something paranormal. And you look, and it was like this disturbing picture, right? They had a mannequin, like a head mannequin that you would put like somebody's wig on or something. They had it in the window, and we're like, oh. It wasn't a ghost. It wasn't a ghost. The Logan Inn is considered to be one of the most haunted buildings in the world. Not just in New Hope, but in the world. There's a lot of things that are out of the ordinary with the Logan Inn. It is not uncommon for guests of the Logan Inn to see soldiers walking back and forth on the third or the fourth floor, floor as if they're patrolling the inn, maybe protecting it. Uh, back in 1776, the British were trying to get across the river to get to the Continental Army, and it's not uncommon for people to see a soldier walking around the roof and the perimeter of the Logan Inn as if he was patrolling, looking to see if, in fact, the British were going to show up across the Delaware River. People have always asked me, so has anything ever happened to you? And then they'll ask me, has anything ever happened on the tour that all of the guests have seen something? And the answer to both of those questions is a resounding yes. I've had a paranormal experience where I've seen a full apparition and it happened twice and both times it happened on a tour and everybody on the tour of about 15, 20 people all shared the experience with me at the same time. It was at the Perry Mansion where there was a woman on the second floor dressed in colonial attire, holding a candle, walking right in front of the window. And unfortunately, by the time I reached to try to grab my phone and take a picture, she was gone. I do think the majority of the residents here in New Hope have embraced the tours because they've had paranormal experiences. And I think because of that, there's a little bit of that community feel that they're happy to share or update stories that we've been telling for 42 years. So if you want to go on one of the tours, go to their website, ghosttoursofnewhope.com. But I'm not going to go with you, okay? As you can tell, I'm in the glass-blowing lab, basically, here at Temple University. I think I've mentioned on the show that I like the glass art. I so want to get in there, but I'd have to sign a waiver. This is so cool. You want to see inside the furnace? Do I want to go inside the furnace? No, just look. Oh, look, just yes. Look. Yeah, yeah. Breland. 
Thanks, Mike. Well, now I'm here with Nicola. She is the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs here at Tyler School of Art and Architecture. And first things first, Nicola, there is a ton of different areas of study here at Tyler. I took classes as a student here at Temple for my art history minor, but there's so much you can explore here at Tyler, right? Yes, we have 22 areas of study that range from the studio arts, painting, sculpture, glass, ceramics, to graphic and interactive design, architecture, city and regional planning, horticulture. That's amazing. So much you can do and take part in, but even if you're not a student, you can still come to Tyler and take advantage of some of the stuff you guys have to offer, right? Absolutely. Temple Contemporary, which is our gallery and sort of functions as the school center, mm -hmm. has uh, exhibitions throughout the year, uh, as well as lectures that are open to the public. So if you're not a student here and you want to take advantage of some of the programs that you just offered, how do you do that? How do you get involved? Right, you can just go to our website at tyler.temple.edu. Awesome. Guys, we'll be right back with more 215 after this short time out. Welcome back to 215. We've moved over to the architecture side mm -hmm. here at Tyler. And this is Elena Ralph. Hi. Hi. You're on TV. I am on TV. <laughs> Your relatives are looking at you oh, right now. Oh, crap. Because you're from... Yeah. Uh, I'm from Philly? Lower Moreland oh. Township in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And you want to be an architect. I do want to be an architect. And you made this. I did make that. That's yeah. your model. This is my model. What is it? It's an art gallery over the Wissahickon Creek. I thought I recognized that creek. Yeah? yeah? Yeah. Good luck to you. Oh, thank you. This is really cool. And you can see so much more uh, when you come visit mm -hmm. Tyler School of Art and Architecture. <laughs> but we want to take you a little bit back in the way back machine. We're Mike. going back. Yeah, going Mike, back. we've been doing this show for about two years now. Yeah. And we've got a lot of wonderful favorites yes, from 215. So here is one of our 215 flashback faves. <laughs> Art was a part of me since I was like very little. My mother was an artist. My pop, you know, he was percussionist, you know what I mean? So the arts was just, you know, in me. I really fell in love with the, with the graffiti aspect of it and like the whole hip hop part of it once we moved to the States. And I was able to see like on the wall. Team arts for me used to be just me, the individual mission that I wanted to do with my gift. I wanted to do more. This is gonna be the Art of Hip Hop workshops that we're doing. We launched a series called Artscapes. And Artscapes is pretty cool because Artscapes was my way of highlighting other artists. The idea is to grab locations that are not your typical gallery setting. The concept of Artscapes is no commission, so 100% of what they make, they keep. You know, And that was the idea, like how do we create this ecosystem of artists truly supporting other artists. Well, these are dope. We did something for FIFA. I was the first um, artist using a graffiti medium to be featured in the art museum. I painted a 40-foot dinosaur at the Academy of Natural Sciences with chalk. That's awesome. Like, that looks, that looks great. Y'all just recently completed the first mural that represents all the elements that come together to create hip hop. Yeah, that's crazy. Yo, this right here basically was kind of like our brainstorming session. I want to put something together that represents all the elements, but I'm like, I don't want it to be cheesy. Yeah, so we got the DJ, we got the breaker. Hip hop is so young. You know, I think about individuals that have been in it, but because hip hop is so young, in the very early stages, there wasn't a lot of documentation. This piece is actually like a cut-in that lives in a cut-in, and we were like, yo, what are we gonna even do there? And then it dawned on us, like, the foundation of hip-hop. Some of our pioneers and some of our heroes, like I call them, they're still here. So it's like, like you know, using my, again, using kind of like my light to cast a light on them. How did you get the title? of a hip-hop ambassador. I was at a rock steady jam with Grandmaster Cass, um, Crazy Legs was there. They started explaining to me how like in their, you know, when 
when this was a baby, before the word hip hop started, when they were, you know, talking about the 70s, right? Um, how all the jams they would do was always community driven. Grandmaster Cast um, is like people that could bestow those kind of like titles on, on you or whatever. You know what I mean? And he says, you know, you know, from here on out, you're a hip hop ambassador. And anybody has a question, they can reach out to me. I'm like, oh my God, yo. It started out in the park, like I mentioned earlier. They used to do it in the dark. I always want the culture to be looked upon in a in a good light. Hip hop catches a lot of, of, of negative, you know, things and, and is quickly a subject to be blamed on when crime is happening. And for me I'm like, nah, there's there's a ton of like incredible positive things happening within the culture. So let me just teach you about it. We'll be right back with more 215 after the break. close the 215 in the cafeteria here at Tyler? Well, Two reasons. Because? We're hungry. Yes. And I love that wall. It, how cool is that, right? It's yeah. the coolest. Thank you so very much to Tyler School of Art and Architecture for hosting us this evening. And guys, remember to join us next week. Yeah. Same time, same place. See you.